Good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me? Good Hello? morning. Good morning. Okay. So you guys morning. get like a little, you're going to see me. This is probably the one and only time that y'all are going to see me. But we have Team Jack all together. And this week I got an early Christmas present. I have my BFF, my best floodplain friend, and my best friend forever, Mr. Julius Lockhart. Morning, everyone. So what? he's... In my office where the magic happens, <laughs> where we do floodplain management um, all the time. But he just wanted to come and say hi. He's going to sit at my other table while I do this and kind of monitor the chat. But so we just wanted to wave and say hi to everybody. Uh, happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Happy everything. So we're going to get started here in just a moment. Sounds good. Okay. And I'm going to turn my camera off. So there you go. All right, Cheyenne, do you want to go ahead and get started? With yes. Announcements? yes. Yes. Do you want to go ahead and share the presentation? Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to the um, December webinar on uh, floodplain management mapping, physical map revisions, and just talking overall about a community's participation when there's a new mapping study in their community and letter of map changes. So just want to say thank you to everyone that took their time out today to attend the webinar. And I'll let Cheyenne go ahead with announcements. OK, and my screen is still black. I don't see the presentation. Do you all see it by chance? No. OK, give us just a second. Yeah, okay. Shut down, Bill. Yeah, come on. Make sure you share. Oh, I was. Sure. You see it now? Okay. Yes, there it okay. is. Sorry, it was it, it was up before okay. Julius. Yeah, go ahead, Cheyenne. I'm sorry. That's all right. Okay, so we just have three announcements for you all this morning. Uh, number one and number two, you've heard before if you've attended the last few webinars, but we're going to go ahead and go over them again uh, for any new faces and also because we still have people not doing this. So number one, um, if you'll put your first and last name as well as the name of your community in the chat box, that way you and your community get credit for this webinar. Um, if we don't have your name and the name of your community, you don't get credit. So please make sure you're putting that in the chat box. On top of that, if you'll go ahead and place your emails in the chat box as well. I've had a few people attend the last few and they receive credit, but I don't have an email address to send their certificate to. So if you'll uh, go ahead and do that for me, that would be super helpful. Um, number two, for all questions and comments, if you'll go ahead and place those in the chat box during the presentation as well. Um, you can also wait until the end of each section. We'll have a spot for you all to make comments and ask questions. But if you have a question or comment that you would just like to go ahead and get out there, 
place that in the chat box and we'll get to it um, as soon as we can. And then the final um, announcement is we have finalized the webinar schedule for 2023. If you don't receive that by the end of the day today, you'll receive it by the end of the week. So be on the lookout for that. That way you can pencil us in for next year. Um, that's all the announcements that I have on my end. So I'll pass the mic over to Ms. Miller. Thank you. All right, everybody. So we're going to talk today about um, the National Flood Insurance Program. Just kind of do a little bit of overview um, as far as the importance of the program. We'll also be talking in the second section about floodplain mapping, exactly what are the different um, types of mapping that a community can receive once they participate in the National Flood Insurance Program or once there's a remapping study that's done. We'll also talk about the mapping study schedule. There are several um, mapping studies going on in Tennessee. So some communities have been wonderful about attending um, the meeting. Some have missed some meetings and we've had a lot of new floodplain administrators. So we're going to go over kind of what that schedule looks like, what's the community's responsibilities, and then we'll also kind of give a little bit of a highlight on letter of map changes. If a property owner feels that they've been inadvertently um, included in the floodplain and they want to try to uh, go submit documentation to FEMA to have that flood insurance requirement waived possibly from their lender, um, we'll talk about that process because there's a lot of questions that floodplain administrators ask me as far as what's the letter of map amendment versus the letter of map revision based upon fill. If I get a letter of map revision based upon fill community acknowledgement form, um, sometimes some of uh, the communities don't want to sign off on that. So we're going to go over why you should sign off on it, but also make sure that all of the I's are dotted and T's are crossed to make sure that it's compliant. So um, with that, we're going to go ahead. Um, all right, so National Flood Insurance Program Overview. So we're going to kind of go over the three-legged stool, what that means exactly, what are the three pillars that holds up the program. We'll talk a little bit about floodplain regulations, what's a flood insurance rate map, why that's important as a floodplain administrator, and then we'll also talk about uh, one of my favorite documents. I think you're on mute, Amy. Can you hear me now? Yes, now we can. Okay. Hey, you're back. Okay. I'm not sure what's going on today. I apologize for the technical difficulties. Let's see if it all comes back up. Okay. All right. I have no idea why that happened. I'm so sorry. Okay. So we talk about the National Flood Insurance Program. There's three main pillars. <laughs> Poor Julius. There's three main pillars of holding up the program. The first one is flood hazard identification. It's mapping. So as we talked about many times before, whenever someone is coming into your office and they're uh, proposing development in your community, the first thing that you want to do as a floodplain administrator is look at your mapping, uh, either use the Tennessee Property Viewer, the FEMA Map Service Center website, the FEMA National Flood Hazard Layer to determine if there's a special flood hazard area on the site. Once you kind of know whether or not development is going to be in or out of the special flood hazard area, if it's going to be in, then you're going to look at your regulations, your flood damage prevention regulations to help you determine how to make sure the development is compliant as far as paperwork and administrative procedures. Is that what you need to do to make that compliant? We did have the uh, floodplain management uh, permitting playbook that we sent out back in September. So if you guys um, haven't had a chance to look at that, that's a really good resource to make sure that you have your permit application, um, your development review checklist, your elevation certificate checklist, how to look up a property. It kind of has everything you would ever want as well as having the development standards written out for each different type of development. And then flood insurance. 
So if I'm building a house and it's in a special flood hazard area, it's in the floodplain, um, I will be required by my lender if I have a federally backed mortgage to have flood insurance. So that's one thing. Another thing I'll just touch on is with risk rating 2.0, insurance agents no longer need the elevation certificate to rate the policy. So if you get questions, there's a different methodology that insurance agents should be using. I still continue to get those questions. So we probably will have something in an upcoming newsletter and try to get that out through the Department of Commerce and Insurance to make sure they understand um, that new policy. Okay, so the stairs case that we have for the 44 Code of Federal Regulations 60.3 really has requirements for participating communities in the National Flood Insurance Program, right? So if we're at the bottom of the stairs, if we're at 60.3a, that means that a community wants to participate in the National Flood Insurance Program, but there's no special flood hazard area identified on the maps. So I'm thinking about coming in the program, but I don't have any maps. I don't have any floodplain in my area that's identified. And then if we go up the next step, um, historically 60.3 level regulations were for flood hazard boundary maps. But then as time has went on and FEMA has uh, had new methodology and new technology, now we have the flood insurance rate maps with greater detail. But these areas, a lot of times, if you think about unincorporated areas of county or rural areas, 60.3 really is for special flood hazard areas that are zone A that um, are approximate. You know, there's floodplain, but you don't have any kind of detailed information. And then 60.3 includes detailed flood hazard information as far as having zone AE without a floodway. Um, you can have zone AO, AH, and those are for shallow or ponding situations where you have one to three feet of uh, potential flooding with BFEs. And then 60.3D has zone AE with BFEs and a regulatory floodway. So as we always kind of joke that um, Julia talks about is candy canes. Um, I will never look at candy canes the same ever again, but we talk about regulatory floodways. He's smiling at me. And then we have 60.3, uh, for coastal areas, you have V zones that are coastal high hazard areas. So essentially when you're going up the stairs, kind of like when you're going in your house at night after work, you're going to start from the bottom to go up to the top to in your living room, in your kitchen, wherever. But it's kind of cumulative that if you have zone A, if you have zone AE without floodway, if you have zone AE with floodways and BFEs determined, all those things are kind of cumulative depending upon your level of sophistication with your flood insurance rate maps and it also kind of mirrors um, your flood insurance or I'm sorry your flood damage prevention regulations that some of it is specified for if you have zone A some of it is specified if you have zone AO, AH, AE so on and so forth so it is kind of cumulative and it does build up that the more detail that you have as far as your flood insurance rate maps the more um, requirements and regulations you may have for proposed development in your community. And again, it is a stair step. If you look at the Code of Federal Regulations, if you ever um, get the book open and you look at Section 60, it has each one of these listed out, all the different requirements. And then when you go to from 60.3a to 60.3b, you will see sometimes it'll say, please refer to, or please refer refer to zone A requirement or 60.3 A requirements. So it is cumulative and it does remind you as you read through there to go back and look at some of the other sections for proposed development in your community. So the flood insurance rate map, we kind of wanted to give a schematic to kind of show that it's the official map of a community. It is issued by FEMA. So FEMA is the one that sets the standards for how flood insurance rate maps are done in Tennessee, let's say Ohio, let's say, New Mexico, there is a standard for every single um, flood insurance rate map, and it does delineate the areas of special flood hazard and uh, risk premium zones applicable to the community. So it is kind of set. You can see the top one, a lot of communities have the black and white maps. Um, Tennessee is very fortunate to have parcel layers on the maps, so you don't have to try to sit there with the ruler and try to measure it out and figure it out. And then you see at the bottom, with the more digital and the ortho imagery where you can have a, a greater level of sophistication and detail on the flood insurance rate maps. 
Now, I will also say if you are a, a, a floodplain administrator, you want to make sure that you have your paper copies of your flood insurance rate maps in your office. If let's say, God forbid, that you're a new floodplain administrator and you can't find them, you can get digital versions online to be able to make determinations when proposed development is coming in your community. So this is an example of a flood insurance rate map index. Uh, a lot of times when you guys get your new copies of flood insurance rate maps, or if you look at the FEMA Map Service Center website, you look under the effective products, the first one has a number and has IND at the end for index. So this is what it looks like to kind of show countywide where the flood insurance rate map panels are located. So if you ever wanted to take a drive, let's say you have a, that you're the floodplain administrator for the unincorporated area of the county, you could print out the maps and kind of have them in order and drive around um, your floodplain to see what areas you have um, flood risk, a high propensity of flooding. And then you can also see too where the different communities, um, you can see lines, let's say for the town of Westmoreland, where um, which flood insurance rate map panels those are included in um, for the different incorporated areas. This is a legend that has information as far as the special flood hazard area it defines what is a special flood hazard area being one percent annual chance um, flooding, also known as, as the base flood or the hundred year flood level, um, and then it also has zone A, AE, AH, AO, so on and so forth delineated as well as you have your candy cane regulatory floodway, and then you have your non-encroachment zone. So for most of you, this is just kind of a refresher that zone A are done by approximate methods. There's no base flood elevations determined. So if you look at a special flood hazard area, you can see a shaded area. You can kind of see like a little blob on the map. You know that there's floodplain in the area, but it doesn't give you base flood elevations. You have zone AE, which is a special flood hazard area that has a 1% annual chance of flooding. Base flood elevations are shown. AH is normally um, a shallow flooding where it has ponding, where the average depths can be between one and three feet, and there's whole foot base flood elevations are shown on the map. The zone AO has shallow flooding as well, which has average depths of one to three feet, and is normally on sloping terrain, and it also has the average whole foot uh, depth shown on the map. Zone X, which is outside the special flood hazard area, so you can either have X unshaded, which means it means completely outside special flood hazard area, and shaded zone X are areas of the 0.2% annual chance flood for the 500 year um, event, and it is subject to flooding with uh, depths less than one foot and contributing drainage area of less than one square mile. So, and you can't have areas protected by levees from the base flood. So definition of a floodway, we have our candy cane at the bottom, and it's the channel of a river or other water course in the adjacent land that must be reserved in order for the uh, discharge of the base flood without cumulatively increasing the water surface elevation more than a designated height. So again, whenever um, you're getting a development proposal, you want to make sure that the uh, surveyor uses a national flood hazard layer to delineate the floodplain versus the floodway and where the proposed development is going um, on the site. So the flood insurance study is the official report provided by FEMA that evaluates flood hazards and contains your flood profiles, your water surface elevations of the base flood. So typically you have what a lot of people you know, sometimes I go meet with people and I say, hey, do you have the flood insurance study? They look at me weird. And then if I say, do you have the little eight and a half by 11 document that has the family getting saved from flood on a boat? People sometimes go, oh, I've seen that, right? So you have that historical view where they had that of a family being rescued. And then now on the right, you have the new um, standardized a flood insurance study format where it just has the state of Tennessee logo and then it has your county, um, you know, delineated on there so you can see. So this is an example from Metro Nashville um, where they got a new flood insurance study that was issued in 2022, February. So sometimes people say, well, Amy, or I have residents will say, Amy, 
these flood maps are wrong. They just went out there and they just arbitrarily drew a line to say this is where the floodplain's at. Um, one time I went up to a community, went to a barber shop, and the owner um, told me that he didn't like that his um, building was in the floodway. There's a stream right behind his building. And then he went outside his building and said, I think, and he just pointed at the ground, he said, I think the floodplain line should stop right here. And so the person, the newspaper reporter, come out and took a picture of it, him pointing at the ground. So we just wanted to kind of show this for topography that whenever they're studying um, a flood insurance rate map and they're developing it, they're really looking at the topography. They're looking at the roughness coefficient. You can see where you have tall grass, concrete, grass again. And, and elevation changes over time due to natural topography um, and due to development or natural areas in your community. But they do actually have surveyors go out, survey the area to make sure that they capture what's going on in the community. So we look at hydrology and hydraulics. Hydrology is the amount of water, the intensity of rain, impervious area, ground cover, drainage area, and you're really thinking about cubic feet per second. And hydraulics is a depth of water in feet with the base flood elevation. So this is a table from a flood insurance study that talks about the summary of discharges. So again, if you ever have questions about Summary of discharges, what are the peak flows? Um, you can see here that information for the various creeks and the various levels and square mile and then their um, discharges for different flood events. So this is kind of important here on the floodway data table. If you're a floodplain administrator and someone is ever coming in and they're saying, hey, my development is right by cross section A, there is a way that you can determine whether or not the base flood elevation is correct on the elevation certificate. Um, and when I first started this job, I didn't know which category over to the right where it had base flood water surface elevation. When I first started, I wasn't sure which one it was because a lot of you guys, same thing like me, you're looking at this, it all looks Greek, which one do I look at? But you actually look at the regulatory um, NAVD number, on the, right there, this highlighted. So if I'm at cross section A for 15th Street t tributary, if a surveyor is giving me an elevation certificate and saying, hey, Amy, it's right beside this um, cross section, I can look at this floodway data table, confirm that it's 284.1. So this is an example of a flood insurance study profile. Um, this was taken from Sumner County. And then when you look at it, sometimes you go, okay, Amy, there's a bunch of lines, there's cross sections, there's a bunch of numbers. What does all this mean? And this is a better schematic to kind of show that whenever um, there's a floodway in an area and FEMA's uh, doing a detailed study, they're going to look to see what the elevation of the stream bed is. Um, you can kind of see the line there with the little triangles at the bottom. You can see at the very, very bottom, the little diamonds that have cross section letters. You can see the 10% uh, area chance of flood, the 50 year, which would be the 2%, the 100 year, which would be the 1%, and the 0.2%, which would be the 500 year event. There's also up at the top, there's uh, st street names, road names, and then they also identify bridges that you can see the bottom of the bridge versus the top with elevation information. So whenever someone is giving you an, an elevation. It's giving you an elevation certificate. They should be. Yeah, they should. They should be giving you um, a flood insurance study profile so that you can know for certain what the base flood elevation is to a tenth of a foot. So again, um, they should be giving you, when they mark off the FIS profile on the elevation certificate, they should be giving you this schematic so you can determine that the surveyor has determined the BFE correctly. So they should be giving you this. If they mark FIS profile and they don't have it with the elevation certificate, you should um, ask for it and not issue the certificate of occupancy until you have it. And then as we've talked about many, many, many times in the notes to users, uh, the firm should not be used to determine the um, base flood elevation. 
Again, the numbers on the maps are rounded to whole foot elevations, so it could be off by four tenths, either positively or negatively. So again, the surveyor should want to use the FIS profile. So if they ever ask, where do you get that, that I can't use a firm, um, this has underlying information. So whenever we go out and do visits, we give this to folks so that they can um, have this in case the surveyor has a question about that. So when we're looking at mapping studies, there's various levels of detail that FEMA does for mapping studies. So the first one we're going to talk about is base level engineering. Um, we have two counties that have base level engineering studies that are completed. We have another four that are going to be coming up. Then we have limited detail study, what that looks like. We'll talk about detail studies and we'll also talk about detailed studies with floodways. So we kind of look at it again, it's kind of like a stair step when we think about um, the level of floodplain regulations. So the first one we'll talk about is base level engineering. Okay, so base level engineering um, is really an efficient modeling and mapping approach that aims to provide technical credible flood hazard data at various geographic scales, such as either community, county, watershed, or state level. And again, this data is meant to complement the current effective flood insurance rate map data, but not replace it. So for areas where there's no flood hazard data that exists, the base level engineering data set may be the only source of flood risk data for the community. So the base level engineering determining factors it's really a mix of currently available and future data sets from both the BLE and other studies that is expected uh, for some parts of the state, multiple sources of flood data will be available. And really it, um, it allows local officials to kind of um, take priority and factors not limited to study level and the age of the study should be considered. And again, BLE is considered an approximate study for users and should always default to the detailed studies on the firm if they're available. Um, a lot of times when we're doing base level engineering is for communities that maybe have a lot of zone A or let's say they have a lot of drainage areas that are unmapped um, that haven't ever had a detailed study. So this is a way to kind of start having more information in a community. Um, the base level engineering data can be used as the best available information for areas with no floodplain mapping and areas identified on the regulatory firm as zone A. So again, for detailed flood zones such as zone A, E, areas on the firm, BLE can only be used if the data is more conservative. So again, it can supplement the effective flood insurance rate map. It's done on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, you can use the base level engineering data to determine and estimate a BFB if there's no effective flood hazard information that exists. Um, if it's similar to or more conservative than a zone A on the firm, and then if it's more conservative than a detailed study. And again, you're not going to use base level engineering to determine an estimated BFB if it is smaller than a zone A on the firm or if it's less conservative than a detailed study firm. Uh, the base level engineering can be used and adopted as best available data by locals without firm or ordinance update. So again, if you have the base level engineering and it has more detailed information, you can do an ordinance or a resolution text change to say that that can be used as the best available data if it's more conservative than what you have on your flood insurance rate map. So I got to give a shout out to my friends in Giles County. Um, Giles County. If you go outside um, Pulaski, it's all zone A. So they didn't really have a lot of um, detailed flood information in Giles County. Um, so essentially when we did the base level engineering um, project, we did a study of 528.8 miles of uh, flooding sources in Giles County that had a drainage of one square mile or greater. Um, it did include 216.6 um, miles of flooding sources that are not in the effective flood insurance study and produced HECRAS model for each flooding source with seven design storms and then also produced a countywide set of 55 work maps 
There was also a change since last firm viewer to compare effective data. And then there was also uh, flood depth grids for the 10% or 10 year, 100 year and 500 year flood events. Now, a lot of times um, when a community gets this information and there's new development coming in the community, I think um, as a floodplain administrator, as emergency manager, or if you're doing a hazard mitigation plan, this is really great to be able to see information on the map and if there was a certain level of flood event to see how much flooding could potentially go in structures, especially if you're having a critical facility come in the community, you want to make sure that it's um, safe from flooding. And if there's another alternative development site that would not have as great a flood potential, I think it's good to use this as that information. The next study that we have is limited detail studies. So they're also known as approximate flood studies um, that they're posted on the flood insurance rate map as zone A. And so if you don't have any kind of information whatsoever, you can have zone A areas. It produces a 1% annual chance floodplain delineation, um, but it also provides an estimated 1% annual chance uh, flood elevation or base flood elevation for use by the community. So we do have two uh, communities that have had limited detailed studies since I've started eight and a half years ago, which was Rutherford and Wilson counties. So just to show you guys what that looks like is that some of my surveyors will say, hey, Amy, I'm working on, let's say, Snarl Creek, I need a profile, and the communities have that. So the limited detail is less rigorous and does not include field surveying of bridges, culverts, or other channel cross sections, but it is more approximate in nature than a full detailed study. And community officials are provided engineering backup data and flood profiles in a separate report called flood profiles for streams studied by limited detailed methods that are used to estimate the 1% annual chance flood elevation along those flooding sources studied by the limited details methods. So this is what it looks like. I just picked one out for Wilson County. Um, sometimes my certified floodplain surveyors will say, hey, Amy, I'm doing work in uh, uh, Rutherford or Wilson County, and do you have those flood profiles? So um, I know that uh, Mike Hughes and I know that Tom Brashear both have these uh, information available, but this is what it looks like as part of the limited detailed study. It has a stream bed and then also has a 1% annual chance delineated on here. So detailed studies are what most of you all um, have seen more in your communities and detailed studies are performed with topographic data and field surveys of channel bathymetry, bridge culvert opening geometry, channel and floodplain characteristics to perform detailed H&H &H modeling of the 10, 50, 100, and 500 year annual chance uh, elevations and boundaries and to delineate floodways. So most of the time when um, risk map started, most communities got detailed studies where they had information. And as time has went on and we have LIDAR and we have ortho imagery and we have partial lines, you can kind of see at the bottom here, this map um, looks better. It has more detailed information. You can see the uh, aqua blue is kind of the special flood hazard area and the rust colored is a shaded zone X, but it has greater detail in it. And then when we have detailed um, studies with floodways, you can see that they're performed using topographic data and field surveys of the channel, bathymetry and bridge and culvert openings and so on and so forth. So we kind of laughed at this picture because it almost looks like a person with a little eye there and the mouth open and kind of Looks, it wasn't intentional. We were just trying to get a map that showed um, a detailed study. And again, this has the greatest detail. So whenever I go out and meet with communities, they always say, Amy, our maps are terrible. Our maps are old. We want to have a detailed study with floodways delineated. So we do have um, information that we submit to FEMA Region 4 for special requests. Like I know um, Mike Hughes from Rutherford County had sent some information to Julius last week saying, hey, there's some areas that need to be restudied. So we know that the need in Tennessee is great to have new maps. Some people have been uh, using maps since 2006, 2007, so on and so forth. They're a little old and outdated and with the development that's um, happening all across the state, um, the maps tend to be old and 
some new detail would be nice. So when we're doing the engineering reviews and there's um, new technical data, we are encouraging um, engineers and um, developers and property owners to submit that new technical data to try to revise the maps as development is happening across the community. So there's a mapping study schedule. So every time that we have a mapping study in Tennessee, um, one of the fun things we get to do is kind of have um, a road show. And so we have a road show and we come um, out to meet with you guys and we have a series of meetings. So we have a flood risk review meeting. Um, we have preliminary map issuance. Then we come back and have a consultation coordination officer meeting. And then there's an appeal and comment period. There's a letter of final determination. And then one thing that probably doesn't get enough um, attention that I kind of want to work on in 2023 is talking about risk communication. Because some of you guys, let's say that you're a planner, let's say that you're a building official. How many of your friends and family know that you guys work on floodplain? Uh, some of you guys are the best kept secret in your community that you help with floodplain management, right? So then whenever there's a new um, uh, flood study that's done in a community and the maps are issued, um, my phone blows up because people say, well, you know, I live in such and such a community. I didn't know there was new maps coming. No one told me. So Julius and I are going to start having uh, <laughs> meetings to kind of talk about risk communication and um, because you guys have to live with the maps, right? So it's kind of like a marriage in the sense that once you get the maps for better, for worse, um, you're going to have those maps and you're going to be working with um, development proposals in your community. So if you're kind of attend the meetings on the front end, you know what's going on. Um, you can talk to your local elected officials to talk about the value and the importance of floodplain management. So we want to make sure that you guys um, are doing that in your community. So there is a preliminary processing schedule you can see here where it talks about flood risk review meeting is kind of the first meeting that we have when we come in and say, hey, we're coming to your city, we're coming to your town, we're coming to your county, and we're going to have a, a mapping study, whether it's countywide, whether it's watershed, um, and kind of talk about what that means for your local community and uh, all these other elements we'll get to here in a moment. So it's important when we have these meetings that we get to see your smiling faces. Um, so when we do have the flood risk review meeting, they call it the FRR. So essentially when we're having a new flood study in a community, FEMA, FEMA's mapping contractor, myself, Julius, Cheyenne, we will send out a meeting invite to the participating communities that are part of the uh, mapping study to say, hey, we're coming. We have an early draft version of the preliminary flood insurance rate maps, flood insurance study, and flood risk products. So essentially we have this meeting to say that you have a new mapping study coming. You have to um, look at these maps, make sure that we have um, stream names spelled properly, that we have street names spelled properly, and kind of look at the maps to see um, how the floodplain is going to be changing in your community, whether expanding or contracting. And then if there's other areas of concern um, to make sure that you're part of those meetings. The one time we had a mapping meeting in Hamilton County and we went to Red Bank and um, the community floodplain official said, hey, you got to look at this map. And so when uh, FEMA was mapping a culvert, it actually had a 14 foot difference um, and it looked like a waterfall. So because the floodplain administrator during that meeting stood there and was looking at the maps and looking at the elevations and saying, I don't think that was right. It was brought to Mark Vieira's attention and the um, error was fixed. So that's where floodplain administrators, emergency managers, local elected officials, it's really crucial that y'all come to those meetings so that you can look at these maps and say, yes, we agree with it. No, we don't and kind of talk about things and really review them to make sure that they accurately reflect what's going on in your community and to address community concerns. Because again, you guys live in the communities. We come, we visit for a day or two and then leave and go back home. But you guys are really the ones that know your flood risk better than anyone else. So again, you can also identify mitigation measures for your community and then communicating with the public about possible changes in flood risk. 
So the preliminary maps issue in. So once we have the meaning to say, hey, we're coming in to do, let's say a Stones River watershed the remapping study, every single floodplain administrator before they leave, um, they go see the mapping contractor to get um, a set of preliminary maps to review. And that's really developed in a partnership with um, FEMA and the mapping contractor. It's based on updated modeling data. They show riverine flood hazards more accurately than previous maps. And the preliminary firms are not are used to help determine flood insurance premiums and construction requirements. And it really is to obtain the most current flood risk information on a property by property basis. We've actually in Tennessee even um, because floodplain administrators are supposed to look at to see where areas have expanded or contracted. And then if somebody calls in, they should be able to tell the property owner what their risk is. And so sometimes some communities, if you're one person and doing 25 jobs, you're going to say, hey, I don't have time. We've also had in the past where um, Jamie Tyson and some of the folks at AECOM have actually done um, some statistical analysis to show how many parcels it was going to increase and how many parcels it was going to decrease and actually have um, street addresses on there. So we've gone above and beyond to try to help floodplain administrators in Tennessee with um, past uh, mapping projects to make sure that they are aware of what's going on. Um, so, but there are some various viewers and different things that you can show folks to do, and we'll talk about that here in a few moments. So preliminary maps are issued to communities. Again, every single um, community is going to get a flood insurance rate map, flood insurance study report, uh, summary of map actions, and digital data. So you can kind of see here on the bottom, and I want to bring a special attention to this. Um, they were laughing at me yesterday when I was talking about this. Um, we always go through the slides before you all see it to make sure that all the I's are dotted and the power T's are crossed. Um, but the one thing is, is that when you guys get the preliminary maps, when they're issued to the community, the floodplain administrator normally gets a package at the meeting. If the floodplain administrator does not attend the meeting, the uh, there's kind of like a tube of maps that are sent via FedEx to the county mayor. So um, unfortunately in Tennessee, we're the only state where we have to have the um, FedEx labels scanned and kept because sometimes we get calls after the mapping meeting or way beyond um, the FRR meeting to say, the flood risk review meeting to say, we never ever got the maps. So this is an example. I actually took this from an email from a community <laughs> that they said they never ever got the maps. So again, we keep receipts to make sure that we know when it was sent. So we can say, hey, it was sent on Valentine's Day. <laughs> 2.41 p.m. and then we also have a copy of the digital signature. So when there is a new mapping study that's coming out, you want to make sure that you say something to the mayor or you say something to their administrative assistant or whoever's in the mayor's office to say, hey, if you get a whole big tube of maps, if you get a whole bunch of paper, please don't throw that away. Please give it to the floodplain administrator. So in the future, as we have mapping meetings, we're probably going to reach out a little bit more to the elected officials to make sure that they know that maps are coming, that they're aware of this study, because again, um, it's really important to be able to identify flood risk to communicate how it's going to be changing in your community and to let citizens and various stakeholders know. So there is a summary of map action. So once um, the preliminary data is sent, there is um, the summary of map actions and essentially there's four different categories. So it talks about letter of map changes that are going to be um, incorporated into the new flood insurance rate maps. There's letter of map changes that are not going to be incorporated. That could be due to scale limitations or the lot or structure involved or outside the special flood hazard area. Um, they will be they will remain in effect until the new flood insurance rate maps become effective then they're not incorporated. And then they also have a list to kind of help floodplain administrators show what letter of map changes are on the revised panels versus what letter of map changes are on unrevised map panels. You have letter of map changes that are superseded by the new maps, and then you have letter of map changes that have to be redetermined. So like, let's say, for instance, you have um, a letter of map change and you have 50 lots and before they were all removed and now with these new maps maybe only 20 are going to be um, 
part are still remain and the other 30 are going to be out. Sometimes with a large submittal, FEMA will request that it be redetermined. That it has to be done on a lot by lot basis. So we have our consultation coordination officer meeting. Um, I love this picture because we did an open house meeting in the city of Franklin for the Harpeth River watershed. It was when I first came on. I think we had 200 people come out that night for the meeting and uh, City Hall used to be an old mall, so it had a nice large hallway, so we we're able to set up. Um, you see this first table here where you have a resident that's come in and is asking about their specific parcel, specific piece of property, and there's a, a table when folks come in to have a property look up to determine is a floodplain area going to remain the same? Is it going to increase? Is it de going to decrease? But once we have our consultation coordination officer meeting, um, we'll kind of talk about uh, the fact that communities need to do education and outreach to the general public and possibly have an open house. Um, sometimes FEMA has money set aside um, in the project budget to have um, an open house. Sometimes there's not money allocated for that. But again, it's really up to the local community to have a meeting to talk to the general public about new flood insurance rate maps. If you don't necessarily have the staff to do an open house, then at least have something on your website where they can look at the um, flood map changes viewer or the changes since last firm viewer to type in their information to see what is effective versus preliminary maps for their property. So again, open houses are a great opportunity to kind of talk about floodplain management to have your um, other, let's say you have planning, let's say you have stormwater, let's say you have other local elected officials that touch floodplain management to have them there um, to provide feedback on the products and to answer questions. So we've had open houses before. I've normally been at those. And so it's kind of fun to sit there with the other floodplain administrators and have people come up and ask questions because then normally I'm the one sitting there talking a lot. And then the floodplain administrators just sit there and smile. So we try to do that, have open houses, um, but again, having risk communication is really important in this process. Um, <laughs> so for appeal and comment period, um, a lot of times I would say in my life when sitting here in this job that I get a lot of comments, good, bad, and ugly when it comes to floodplain management, right? The good is kind of once in a blue moon, the bad is quite often, and the ugly can be quite often too. But essentially, when new flood insurance rate maps um, are being issued to a community, FEMA allows um, the stakeholders an appeal and comment period. So comment is an objection to base map features such as labels, incorrect roads, jurisdictional boundaries, or other non-appealable changes. So essentially, you could submit something to FEMA to say, I don't like these maps, these maps are terrible. That's a comment. OK, so you have 30 days to do that. And then the appeal period, there's 90 days where if a community doesn't, let's say they don't agree with the, the floodway boundary, they can hire an engineer and do provide um, new scientific and technical data to show that the proposed flood zone uh, boundary floodway base flood elevations are scientifically incorrect. So it has to be um, scientific and technical, but a lot of people get it confused and they think, well, if I just sit here and complain and say, I think these maps are terrible, that's an appeal and something's going to be done, but that's not the case. It has to have scientific and technical data to back that up. So again, you have to have an explanation for alternative methodology. You can have an H&H &H study, hydrologic, hydraulic analysis, um, revised flood profiles, and then you can also have revised floodplain and floodway boundary delineations. So after uh, the uh, appeals and comments and everything has been um, addressed, after that 90-day appeal period and everything has been resolved, FEMA is going to issue a final a letter of final determination. So along with the letter of final determination, there's a final summary of map actions it's sent informing the community of letters of map change that are going to be revalidated or superseded or need to be redetermined. And then there's a six month compliance period 
during which the community will adopt new flood insurance rate maps into their flood damage prevention regulations. So essentially, once you get this letter of final determination, the clock starts that you have six months to adopt the new flood insurance rate maps. So the community's responsibilities. So what, what is a community's responsibility? So one thing that I would say is that a lot of times in life we procrastinate, right? This is one thing that you don't want to procrastinate. This is one of those things that if you don't um, readopt your flood insurance rate maps and your flood insurance study into your flood damage prevention regulations by the date, by the six month date, um, on midnight, your community will be suspended from the program. So there's no kind of get out of jail. There's no kind of if I send Julia some candy canes because he's sweet, <laughs> that he's going to get out of it or I'm going to sweet talk Amy and say, you know what? I just forgot. Doesn't fly. So again, the community has to adopt the new uh, firm panels within six months after the adoption, a copy. So again, kind of like one of my favorite songs, signed, sealed, delivered, that once you adopt the new flood insurance rate maps in your flood insurance study, you have to have that copy sent to myself and I forward it to Julius for review. So we're going to be having a meeting. Um, soon i think on the 12th with the stones river watershed we have all the new uh ordinances resolutions revised for adoption and so we're going to meet with all the communities to go over um adopting those uh, panels and then uh, making sure that they get to us before may 9th 2023 so um we're going to have a meeting and then uh, fema requires that my office every two weeks has a report of what y'all are doing so you don't want to drag too far because if you have two readings, if you have three readings before it's signed and approved, you want to make sure that it gets on the docket as soon as possible. So it is important to make sure um, that you're on the ball with that. And then risk communication. Citizens are going to look to local officials to keep them informed of flood risk. I know like in Tennessee, it's always a volunteer Amy for everything when it comes to floodplain management. But um, as being the local official, there are going to be folks that are going to come into your office and have questions or be surprised when there's new flood insurance rate maps that come in. So again, you want to make sure that your local elected officials, whether it's your city council, whether it's your aldermen, um, whomever, county commissioners, that you make sure that you tell them that uh, a new flood insurance rate map study is being done. And then regular communication is really important about what your flood hazard and risk are in the community. And then what the steps can citizens take to protect their property, their home, and then also uh, hazard mitigation plans. Because if you have a new hazard mitigation plan that's being um, created, you want to make sure that the person that's writing the plan is aware of the new flood insurance rate maps, that there was a new study. And then also have a public open house meetings for folks. Another one that's really um, crucial, I think, is that um, communities have website information on floodplain management, right? So Cheyenne and I and Julius were writing up um, community assistance visits, reports, and letters. And one of the things that's part of the report is, does the community have any information on their website about floodplain management? So sometimes on websites, there's information about building codes, there's information about getting a building permit, but there's nothing on their website about floodplain management. So we would like to see communities start to do a little bit more education and outreach, because as we all know, um, as there's more rain events that come into Tennessee, there's increased risk for flooding. Um, floodplain management is going to become more important over time. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. So you want to make sure that you have that information available. And there's also um, this uh, FEMA flood risk toolkit for community officials. So you can kind of see here that um, has information about um, a guide to supporting engagement and resiliency. And then there's, um, okay, how should you have your messaging guide, right? So there's information here. Um, there's all kind of stuff. So again, if you want a flood risk communication video, there's a video. Um, there's all kind of things. And then, you know, like let's say that you ever want to do training and outreach and you want to know how to design an effective public meaning. There's information here. Social media guide. 
So if you guys are ever interested in this, um, there's various guides, there's various things on here that you can look at um, to kind of frame your communication outreach for folks. It's really good. Hey, Amy, can you go back a slide? I'm sorry. One slide from there, right there. The last line, Stones River Watershed, says the LFD was issued November 9th. And then and LFD issued May 9th. Does that mean isn't isn't don't the map? Oh, sorry. Effective? Sorry, that's a typo on mine. It should be that the flood insurance rate maps have to be adopted by May 9th. Sorry. Right. OK. All right. That's what I thought. Thank you. OK, we'll fix that for the final. OK, so we also had changes since last firm viewer. It is a powerful tool where you can help um, property owners understand what their current flood risk is versus their future flood risk. Unfortunately, right now the FEMA website is down, so we just wanted to ha show you a picture of kind of what it looks like um, when you're looking at um, flood risk a little bit. So some of the websites and some of the products on the FEMA site right now are kind of fussy and not working, so we tried a little bit yesterday to get that to work. But again, there is a change since last firm viewer that is a powerful tool. So we do have the letter of map change process. So sometimes when there's new maps that come into a community, um, there's people that think that they're inadvertently included in there. Um, so there's questions whether you have new maps or whether you have existing maps that floodplain administrators aren't always aware um, of the various types and what they mean and different things. So we're going to go through that. So we have the letter of map changes that we're going to talk about the umbrella term. We're going to talk about conditional letter of map changes, what that means. And then we'll talk about letter of map amendment, letter of map revision based upon fill, and letter of map revisions. So um, a letter of map change in their purpose. A letter of map change is a letter that reflects an official revision or amendment to an effective flood insurance rate map. So you can either remove a property from a special flood hazard area, but FEMA has to issue the letter of map change. So you can say, hey, I shouldn't be in a floodplain, but unless you have the official determination document from FEMA, it's not going to necessarily waive your flood insurance requirement, and it's not necessarily going to waive you happen to follow your flood damage prevention regulations unless you have that official determination document from FEMA. So again, why would anybody want to apply for one? If they believe um, that they've been inadvertently included, if they have a federally backed mortgage and they're required to purchase flood insurance, and let's say they don't believe that they should, um, and if a letter of map change removal is issued, again, property owners may be eligible for lower flood insurance premiums or have the option to not purchase flood insurance. So the, the biggest thing that I tell folks is that when they're thinking about doing a letter of map change, the first thing they should do is talk to their lender to make sure that if they go th jump through all the hoops to try to get a determination document, that they'll be able to have that flood insurance requirement waived because it could be one of those things and it has happened before that if um, I have had it waived, that my lender says, hey, you still have to have flood insurance. So again, it's always good to check before you do it. So we think about letter of map changes, there's kind of two avenues that you can go through, right? One is an amendment that's not going to change a flood insurance rate map or the flood insurance study profile. Those are called amendments. And then you have revisions that are going to change a flood insurance rate map and a flood insurance study. So we're going to kind of talk about the amendments, a letter of map amendment using the MTEZ form, MT1 form, or letter of map revision based upon fill, you're going to use the MT1 form. Now you say, Amy, what does the MT mean? I don't know. They just come up with it. Huh? Oh, it's in mitigation one, mitigation two. Okay, I guess it's mitigation one, <laughs> mitigation easy, mitigation one, and mitigation two. I don't, I don't, you're right. I, I'm making it up as I go. But anyway, they, they've always had these kind of little letters with the, the forms that people fill out. So, um, We'll kind of go through that today. So again, MT1 forms means that it's bound to the effective maps and the flood insurance study. It doesn't result in physical changes to the effective 
flood insurance rate map. So if I got a letter of map amendment based upon natural grade, uh, I'm not, the community is not going to get issued a new flood insurance rate map to show like a little tiny <laughs> rectangle has been removed from the flood insurance rate map. But the ultimate goal really is to remove the insurance requirement. And then the MT2 is more complicated. Let's say you have a um, stream encroachment. So you're going to have uh, technical changes for new development. And if there's changes to the hydraulic and characteristics and it results in a revision to the physical effective firm, therefore the community must be involved. So we had what last month um, we talked about engineering analysis or whenever that was. Um, we talked about how you have to, if there's changes in the base flood elevation, base flood discharge or floodway widths, um, you've got to submit that new technical data to FEMA to have the flood insurance rate maps revised and a flood insurance study. So conditional letter of map changes. So conditional letter of map changes are based upon proposed development. So again, if I'm proposing to build a structure on ground that's naturally higher than the base flood, elevation i can uh, send in that document for fema to comment to say yes amy where you're proposing to have your house this is correct and then there's also the conditional letter of map revision based upon phil if i'm bringing phil onto my lot to elevate um, the building pad above the base flood elevation is this level of fill enough to have me waive from the flood insurance requirements or from paying flood insurance and from having to follow the National Flood Insurance Program regulations. And then there's a conditional letter of map revision that if my proposed development are gonna uh, bring changes um, to the development area, there's gonna be proposed changes. I have to submit that to FEMA to get that approved before my development takes place. So again, a conditional letter of map amendment really um, involves if a proposed project um, where the elevation of the structure is on natural ground. So again, sometimes you hear people say, well, hey, I have this 50 acre lot I got from my granddaddy. <laughs> then there was a farm and I'm building up, you always hear this, I'm building up on a hill. Okay, well, if you're building up on a hill, then um, submit a cloma to say that that natural grade is at or above the base flood elevation. It would not be um, inundated by the base flood. And then it does not remove your floodplain designation. It doesn't waive your floodplain management requirements. And again, if you want to have that wave of um, flood insurance potentially, and um, also getting away from the floodplain management requirements, you're going to want to follow that up um, with a letter of map amendment. So again, this is just a comment document to say, yes, what you're proposing to do um, would be acceptable, but you have to follow it up with a letter of map change. Same thing for a conditional letter of map revision based upon fill. So a conditional letter of map revision based upon fill is a comment document on whether a structure or parcel of land that will be elevated by fill will be located within a special flood hazard area after the project is complete. Does not remove floodplain designation, does not waive floodplain management requirements. It's, and then you have to follow it up with an as-built letter of map revision based upon fill. Um, it has to follow a conditional letter of map revision for an official change. So again, a lot of times people in Tennessee don't really want to mess with this because they're saying, if I'm going to do this, I only want to pay for the application fee once and they just go ahead and do the letter of map changes. But every once in a while, um, you do have the conditional. So then a conditional letter of map revision is a comment on the impact of the proposed project to floodplain boundaries, flood, floodway boundaries or BFEs. And it has to be followed by a letter of map revision. And then there, the National Flood Insurance Program does require a clomer when the floodway encroachments increase a BFE, base flood elevation, base flood discharge, floodway widths, or if you have a zone AE without a floodway development and it's going to raise a BFE more than a foot. And then communities can pass the responsibility to obtain a conditional letter of map revision to the developer through the local floodplain ordinance. So again, um, this is something that's important. We're thinking about rewriting the flood damage prevention regulations. So we're thinking about how that there's going to be kind of like a two track framework, whether the applicant has to go through FEMA to get it approved or go through TEMA, but to make sure that somebody's reviewing these um, to detail the impact of development along streams. 
So letter of map amendment, um, this is where it kind of sticks. It's a letter from FEMA stating that the existing structure or parcel of land has not has not been elevated by Phil. So again, I'm on natural ground. I'm on that. I'm on that hill and I'm not in the holler. <laughs> It's amazing how I have these southern words in my vocabulary I never had before. But you have it up on a hill, it's elevated on natural grade, um, and it usually is used to show that the structure is out of a special flood hazard area. It's not required by floodplain management regulations, but again, it's based upon natural ground elevations and there's no physical change to the firm. So when you think about doing a letter of a map amendment and you know that A is on the end, you think it's already, right? It's already natural gray, it's already higher than the base flood elevation. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to make any kind of changes, right? It's just already there for me. It's just all ready to go. So um, that's one way that you can kind of think of it. So this is a letter of map amendment document. that's saying it's a removal and then it's saying that the removal is a structure. So again, if someone says that they're doing a letter of map change, again, you want to have this official determination document and look at it before um, you determine whether or not they have to, if, if the flood damage prevention regulations are waived or if they're going to have to follow them. If you get one and you're not quite sure, you can always email me and say, hey, Amy, what does this mean? And I can look at it and tell you. Um, so the next one is a letter of map revision based upon fill, and this provides the official flood hazard determination that the individual structure property has been elevated by fill. And again, usually it's going to show that the structure has been elevated out of the special flood hazard area. One thing that I would tell you guys is that sometimes um, there's developments that's come in, like a, let's say a major subdivision or let's say a five lot subdivision. They put they've elevated all the building pads. What they should do, the developer should submit a letter of map revision based upon fill so that if I'm buying the lot, then I'm not going to have to have um, the requirement to purchase um, flood insurance. So sometimes like we'll be driving around doing a, a cab and we can see where all the building sites have been elevated up, but none of them have a letter of map revision based upon fill documentation. So sometimes people that buy these um, lots don't know that the work's already been done for them or if there's an elevation certificate and the lowest adjacent grade is at or above the BFE because they brought in fill, um, it would just be good to kind of bring that up to people because sometimes there's there's probably many folks in Tennessee that are paying for flood insurance where they really don't have to because this has been done, but nobody filled out the paperwork. So again, there's no physical change to the firm and then it does require community approval in signing the community acknowledgement form. So this is what it looks like, a letter of map revision based upon fill. Um, again, it's a portion of the property. One thing that you'll see sometimes is that it'll say portions of the property remain in the floodway, or if it'll say remain in the special flood hazard area. We've had people argue before and say, no, my whole lot's out. No, my whole lot's out. If you get that where someone's arguing and it says at the bottom of the document that portions remain, you have to go through the FEMA mapping and information exchange to request the case file so that you can see what still remains. So we had an instant in East Tennessee where the portions remained and they had a site plan and then um, Julius is amazing was able to get the application package and the map and we were able to determine that the future development on the site was outside. But without that information from the FMIX, we wouldn't have known and the floodplain administrator wouldn't have known as well. So the one thing um, that I have tried to advocate since the whole time I've been here is that whenever someone is doing a letter of map change, that up at the very top, it'll have letter of map amendment dash DEN, and that means denied. So I don't, I don't understand why they don't have the red rubber stamper and go denied, right? Because if you're a floodplain administrator and you've never seen one of these documents before, you're not going to know where to look. So we just kind of have this highlighted that it's denied. Um, and then also the other key is that it's not saying it's removal, it's non-removal, so nothing is getting removed. But again, you know, if I was queen for the day, I would change FEMA <laughs> and make them have that red stamper. I would even be the one that would stamp some of the documents. I think it'd be fun. But you can see here that the 1% annual um, 
chance of um, or the BFE is 380.2 and the lag is 357.2. So again, it's almost three feet below. So um, that's why it was denied. So if you ever have questions, um, I did a cab one time in a community and the floodplain administrator didn't look at it and thought that because he got the removal document that it was good. And then when we looked at it, it was denied. So they went ahead and approved the development um, and they didn't have to follow the floodplain regulations. So that area is very susceptible to flooding. So again, if you have questions, um, let me know if you're not sure what you're looking at, um, we can help you but we want to make sure that things are done in compliance. So again, with submitting a letter of map amendment, this is going to be done by a Tennessee licensed surveyor. They're going to have a copy of the firm panel, so you're going to have a firm met. You're going to have a tax assessor's map, copy of the recorded subdivision plat map, uh, elevation form if there's not an elevation certificate, and then a property information form. Now I could go through this in great detail, but we actually do that through the certified floodplain surveyor class. So um, keep in mind that surveyors are the ones that have to fill all this stuff out. And for Aloma, you're not necessarily going to look at all that. So if I have any surveyor surveyors on the call that have questions, um, we can send you some information afterwards to kind of help with the case file management. So this is just more information that they're going to put the community number and, you know, is it existing or proposed? What type of uh, foundation for construction and so on and so forth. So for submitting the letter of map revision based upon fill, um, there is a community acknowledgement form that a, a community has to sign off on to say that the development or the fill is not in a floodway and that it complies with the Endangered Species Act and that all state and federal permits have been obtained and that the existing and proposed structures are reasonably safe from flooding. So when we think about reasonably safe from flooding, we're talking about that the base flood waters will not inundate the land or damage the structure to be removed, and that any subsurface waters related to the base flood will not damage existing or proposed buildings. FEMA can take up to 60 days to, um, once you submit, or once the surveyor submits a letter of map revision based upon fill, it can take up to 60 days. So, um, it's been kind of popular lately that when we have engineering reviews that people are asking within a week if it's been reviewed. Um, so again, like um, Julius has a favorite phrase, this manage expectations. It's in my vocabulary now, personally and professionally, but you got to manage expectations. So again, if you're a surveyor, make sure that your client understands it can take up to 60 days. It's not something you're going to get back right away. So again, um, there is a community acknowledgement form. So this is what it looks like right here. We're going to go into greater detail, but additional documents that are required is a firm at tax assessor's map, uh, recorded uh, plat map or property deed, elevation form and property information form. So one thing that always kind of I find interesting in this job is that there is a community acknowledgement form and I like this bullet point because it says that the community takes ownership. So taking ownership means that you should know what's going on, right? That, you know, if you take ownership of a house, let's say you buy a house and you get the keys, right? And you're taking ownership of it. You should, you know, kind of um, have a property disclosure form. You should have an inspection. You should walk through it. Look at the neighborhood, right? Look at the topography. Look at everything to make sure that it's exactly what you want is a dream home so that it doesn't become a nightmare, right? So same sort of thing with the community acknowledgement form is that for floodplain management purposes, if you're taking ownership, that means that if I'm coming in with the community acknowledgement form and I put fill on the lot to elevate my structure, or elevate my property, I should have come in and gotten a floodplain development permit. And I should also give you a site plan to show um, the proposed and um, the existing uh, maps with fill to show the elevations, right? Because one of the biggest things that we get in trouble here in Tennessee is that we have fill being placed on lots and all of a sudden that fill that was in the floodplain has kind of migrated over into the floodway and then we get potential violation letters. So sometimes you guys just kind of blindly sign off on the community acknowledgement form and you don't know where the fill was actually placed and then all of a sudden, you know, FEMA reviews this letter of map change within 60 days and then they send a potential violation letter to the community and says, hey, 
let's say Cheyenne put Phil on the lot and they send a letter to Cheyenne and say, hey, Cheyenne, you put Phil in the floodway. You've got to do an engineering analysis. Then it opens up this big can of worms, right, that you don't want to even smell, look at, see, because you kind of just blindly signed off on the form and you didn't really take ownership of the de floodplain development in your community. So again, you want to make sure that you sign off on the form. You want to make sure that you have the proper documentation and that it's definitely not in a regulatory floodway. So there's three things that you kind of want to think about when you're um, signing off on a community acknowledgement form. So the first one that I kind of alluded to just a moment ago is that it meets or is designed to meet all the community's floodplain management requirements. So again, did I get a permit? Did it get a site plan pre and post fill with elevations, right? And did I make sure I looked at the site plan to make sure that it's not in the regulatory floodway? And is there any kind of state or federal permits that need to be done? That's really important. The next thing is, and I don't think that a lot of people have been thinking about this, is that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service over in Cookville no longer does endangered species um, determinations for applicants. So what they do is they send you a website and then the applicant has to type in their address and see if there's anything on there. And then if there isn't anything on there, then I guess you just print it out and say, hey, there's nothing on there. And then if there is something on there, then you have to work with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to determine if you're hurting an endangered species or an endangered plant, so on and so forth. So again, there should be Endangered Species Act compliance documentation. Um, again, you can't have anything that's going to be considered a taking or harming an endangered species. And then if the action might harm them, then you have to work with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service under Section 10 of it. So again, there should be documentation with that um, for a conditional letter of map provision based upon fill. So um, and then the other thing is to make sure that it's reasonably safe from flooding. So again, is there documentation to make sure um, that the land and any existing or proposed structures are going to be reasonably safe, that water isn't going to inundate the parcel, the structure, so on and so forth. So again, those are the three things. Um, another issue that we have sometimes is that communities may have all this documentation and then they refuse to sign off on it. It's not a good look. So again, if someone's coming in and they have this documentation, all the I's are dotted, T's are crossed. If you don't have the documentation initially, get it once you've got it and you feel that it's um, that it's uh, compliant as far as having a development permit, the site plans, the Endangered Species Act is reasonably safe from flooding. Um, a community should sign, and it's not, there's no fill or anything in a regulatory floodway or a stream. You can sign off on it. Um, I get a little bit frustrated sometimes because people come in and they'll say, well, I don't want to sign off on it. And so then the surveyor calls me going, what do I do? And then I have to get involved, right? So again, if you're a participating community, every single community has an identified floodplain administrator. This is part of your duties. If you don't understand what's going on, reach out and call. Somebody reached out and called while I was doing this presentation. But if you have questions, you can reach out and I'll be more than happy to help. Um, Julius, Cheyenne, um, Team Jack is always available. You always want to start with me first, um, but we'll be able to help you if you have questions. So again, letter map revisions are needed to incorporate post firm changes into the community's effective firm. So examples, if there's physical changes to a water course or floodplain boundaries, if there's any kind of stream alteration, relocation, um, if there's any kind of development encroaching a stream and there's rises after it's been built within six months, a letter of map revision has to be um, done to incorporate those changes to reflect changes in the base flood elevation, base flood discharge, floodway widths. And then um, even if you have better technical data, uh, let's say into existing studies with LIDAR or correcting known FEMA study error, error, errors, you can do that. And then again, you can also update um, or refine a flood hazard information that's used to create the firm. If there's a results and adjustment to the height of the BFE um, and then making sure that you have the most accurate information for flood risk determination and then it has to have engineering analysis and scientific data. So how are these applications submitted? Some are submitted via USPS, 
Some of them are online through the um, online eLoma, the electronic letter of map amendment that can be done. Surveyors are the ones that have to have username and password. So make sure you keep your password handy. Um, one surveyor who I'll leave nameless um, can remember his password. So that was kind of fun. So again, um, when it comes to mapping studies in your community and letter of map changes, um, you guys should have your paper maps and digital maps readily available, as well as your flood insurance study information. So a lot of times when Cheyenne and I are going out and doing visits, even Julius, if the community is new to floodplain management and there's a new floodplain administrator, we try to have uh, the flood insurance study printed for them so they have that information. The flood insurance rate maps are available digitally. You can also download um, the National Flood Hazard Layer on your community's GIS website if that's applicable. And then again, you want to participate in the mapping studies. It's great for me to know about a mapping study. It's great for Julius to know a mapping study, but it's even better if you're the local floodplain administrator and you know about the mapping study because it's a way that you can participate to know more about floodplain management, to evaluate how your flood risk is going to increase or decrease in your community. And then it's a way to have all these different resources as far as um, FEMA Region 4, the mapping study, uh, to have Mark Vieira, the mapping uh, engineer on there, as well as having AECOM is our mapping contractor. Um, there are great resources if communities have problems or issues. And then making sure that you engage various stakeholders. Because if you're the only one that knows about a new mapping study and no one else does, everybody's going to be disappointed <laughs> that you knew it and you didn't tell them. So again, you want to engage various stakeholders so that everyone's on the same page about the new maps and then making sure um, letter of map changes, that you have the proper documentation and then it's compliant with the FEMA regulation this is really important. So I think with that, if you guys have any questions or comments, we'll look in the chat. Um, we do have our 2023 series coming out in January, so we'll be getting that out this week. Um, Julius will be in town all this week, so we'll um, going to be working on a variety of projects and different things that are upcoming. So it continues to be busy here in the NFIP office, um, but we really appreciate everyone's time today on the webinar. And with that, I will be quiet and see if there's anything else that anybody needs. Two folks had questions um, from Shannon. All right, so everyone's super quiet. So with that, um, we will end the meeting today. Hope you all have a good holiday. If you need anything, just reach out, email, phone call. Um, and with that, we're done. So thank you. Thank you. Hey, Amy.